Good morning. It's 830 on Wednesday, February 9th. I'm Desiree Frazier. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. On today's show, the future of the ballot initiative process. Then we find out how Mississippi scored on this year's American Lung Association tobacco report. And we talk with Mississippi Book Festival director and the Governor's Arts Award winner, Holly Lang. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Mississippi lawmakers have put forth a plan to restore the state's ballot initiative process. But as MPB's Kobe Vance reports, the resolution would change how residents can modify state law. Representatives in Mississippi have passed House Concurrent Resolution 39, which would reestablish ballot initiatives in the state. The process previously allowed residents to amend the Constitution. However, it was ruled unconstitutional in 2021. Republican Representative Nick Bain says this resolution would only allow the initiative process to create, amend, or repeal state statute, rather than amend the Constitution. He says this would make it easier for the legislature to adjust laws in the future. Cannot do anything by statute that the Constitution would prohibit. Uh, Appropriations cannot be made through the initiative process. Uh, Initiative measures shall be restricted to one single subject matter, but you can have up to five measures on the ballot. Because this amendment prevents residents from directly amending the state's constitution, they must petition legislative leaders to place amendments onto the ballot. Democratic Representative Daryl Porter of Summit says there were several attempts to modify the resolution to more closely mirror the older initiative process, but each measure failed. Well, I don't necessarily agree with that portion of the bill. and I think if people want to be able to change their state constitution, then they should be able to have an avenue to do that. Obviously, that avenue is through the, um, through the initiative process. So I do not agree with that portion of the bill. The resolution passed 91 to 26. Lawmakers say it will likely face several changes in the Senate or in conference, and Mississippians will have the final vote on adoption into the state's constitution. Could be Vance, MPB News. Coming up, we find out how Mississippi scored on this year's American Lung Association Tobacco Report. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Deep South Dining is the show all about the culture of Southern flavor. From fried chicken and collard greens to shrimp and grits and a glass of sweet tea. Subscribe now to the podcast using any podcast app or download our MPB public media app. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Desiree Frazier. The American Lung Association has released its annual State of Tobacco Control Survey. The study measures the strength of anti-tobacco laws in each U.S. state and awards each one a letter grade. The firmer the regulation the better the grade. How did Mississippi fare, you ask? Well, not so great. In the category of tobacco prevention, the state scored an F. In fact, Mississippi earned an F in each and every one of the survey's categories, which also included smoke-free air, tobacco taxes, access to secession services, and flavored tobacco products. Ashley Lyerly is with the association. This is the 20th anniversary of of this report, and while we have seen um, some progress and reduction in, you know, over the 20 years, reduction in smoking rates and and tobacco use rates, um, we still really haven't seen um, the level of policies that really are going to result in significant tobacco use um, reduction. And a lot of that has to do with the lack of of statewide policies. So in the state of Mississippi, we do not have a statewide comprehensive uh, smoke-free air law. And, um, you know, we've seen at the local level, um, local municipalities have responded to the needs of their constituents, and there are 174 total smoke-free air ordinances at the local level. But that still leaves approximately 68% or so of the population that are exposed to secondhand smoke. So that's just one example um, of of ways that we need to um, sort of protect people from tobacco use and exposure to secondhand smoke would be to pass a comprehensive statewide smoke-free air law. And that would be the smoke-free air category that you have here that we got an F in. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay. That's correct. On taxes, there have been numerous efforts to increase uh, cigarette taxes at the legislature, but they don't pass the full legislature. 
That's correct. Yeah. So over the past couple of years, um, there's been a concerted effort by public health advocates to, to advocate for increasing um, the price of tobacco products. And um, they're really just just it hasn't crossed the finish line yet. Um, but we know that, you know, with Mississippi only having a cigarette tax rate of 68 cents, um, that is making the products affordable to youth and young adults. And um, we know that if we significantly increase the price by a dollar, a dollar fifty, um, we're going to see a reduction in youth initiation and consumption. Um, we also want to see that equitable tax on other tobacco products, so we don't have a transition of youth from not only using, you know, stop using cigarettes, but transitioning to say little cigars or other smokeless tobacco products. And then I think what we haven't talked about yet is also, you know, the role of e-cigarettes in the um, this, you know, tobacco use epidemic that we have. Have, um, in the state of Mississippi and, and nationwide, and one of the things that we really need to, to rein in on um, is, you know, tobacco policies that cover e-cigarettes um, because they are um, undercutting the progress that we've seen over the last 20 years um, in redu- reducing tobacco use. There have also been efforts to write some laws that involved e-cigarettes, but it didn't go well with that either. What would you like to see in terms of laws for e-cigarettes to reduce usage by young people? Yeah, so I mean, I think first and foremost, um, you know, the inclusion of e-cigarettes in um, a statewide smoke-free air law. Um, if we had a comprehensive smoke-free air law in the state of Mississippi, we would want to make sure that, that e-cigarettes are included in that. So we begin to have this sort of social norm change where e-cigarettes are not acceptable in public places and, and workplaces. And then, as I said um, just a minute ago, um, looking at making sure that those price, those um, products are treated like tobacco products and that they are taxed appropriately um, and part of our overall tobacco control statutes in the state of Mississippi. Talking about trying to quit smoking from smokers, they tell you it's very difficult. This shows that we don't have enough funding for that, according to the American Lung Association. Yeah, so looking at our, you know, sort of access to cessation services for Mississippi, you know, we are very fortunate that both Medicaid and the state employee health plans do provide um, all seven medications um, that are recommended to, to quit. Um, but we do have some barriers to accessing counseling. So we know that it's going to take an average of seven quit attempts for the average smoker um, to officially quit. Um, and we want to make sure that those who, who quit have access at all times to not only the seven nicotine, you know, FDA approved nicotine replacement therapy medications, but also to all forms of counseling. Um, we also want to make sure that our state quit line, which provides, um, you know, free services to those who are interested in quitting, is funded um, adequately to respond to the needs of um, tobacco users in the state of Mississippi. And I would just point this out in this report, you have that um, there are no regulations for Restaurants, bars, casinos, retail stores, recreational, cultural facilities, I guess those places would make their own smoking regulations or have their own rules in place. Yes, at this point, with in in with the void of a statewide smoke-free air law, um, many uh, you know businesses would have to regulate uh, exposure to secondhand smoke um, at their own individual place, unless um, they're located in a uh, either a local city, so a municipality, or a county that has passed its own local smoke-free air law. So, in the state of Mississippi, we have 174 uh, municipalities and counties that have passed local smoke-free air laws, um, but that only covers about um, 32 percent of the population being exposed to secondhand smoke. And so we have a significant portion um, of the population that are not protected from exposure to secondhand smoke. They might walk into a, a restaurant or a casino or a bar or even just a private workplace, could be a law office, and could be exposed to secondhand smoke, depending on the local regulations and what that individual business has decided to do. Lastly, why should people care? 
Well, um, tobacco use is the is the nation's leading cause of preventable death and disease, um, and this is something that we've known for for many years now. Um, and so, you know, we see a not only the burden of tobacco use, but also a disproportionate burden of tobacco use and exposure to secondhand smoke in communities experiencing health disparities. Um, we've seen a decline over the last couple of years um, in our smoking rates, but Mississippi continues to have an adult smoking rate of about 20%. And unfortunately, we also see that the high school tobacco use rate is at about 27.6%. So we have a long way to go, um, and we really need to address um, the issues that we have related to tobacco prevention and control um, and tobacco use to reduce tobacco use in the state of Mississippi. And you may have said this, but more than 5,000 Mississippians die every year from tobacco-related use? That is correct. And, and, you know, in the nation as a whole, um, you know, tobacco use kills about, you know, 4,800 people every year. Um, And so we've got, you know, about 16 million Americans who are living with tobacco-related disease. And so if we institute some of these policies, we fund our programs adequately, we allow people access to to quit tobacco, um, we will hopefully see a reduction in those those numbers. Ashley Lyerly, thank you so much for your time in speaking with us about the American Lung Association report. Thank you so much. Coming up after a Southern Remedy Health Minute, we talk with Mississippi Book Festival director and the Governor's Arts Award winner, Holly Lang. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. This podcast is a local production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting and depends on the support of listeners like you. If you can, please donate today at mpbonline.org. And thanks. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Desiree Frazier. Students at historically black colleges and universities still processing last week's wave of bomb threats. Yesterday, leaders from four HBCUs HBCUs in Mississippi, Louisiana, and Florida met virtually to discuss how best to move forward. The Gulf States Newsroom's Bobby Jean Missick has more. All but one of the four schools, Dillard University, received threats at the start of Black History Month. Leaders met in a virtual roundtable. It was organized by the Southern Poverty Law Center and included Dr. Michelle Asha Cooper from the U.S. Department of Education. The timing of these threats was a likely attempt to exploit tensions among some factions of our society. Cooper assured the schools that federal authorities are investigating the threats. School leaders also responded to news that the six suspects identified are minors. One may be connected with hate group Adam Waffen Division. They say this fact shouldn't lessen public outrage over the threats and also emphasize that those responsible may need mental health care. Dr. Walter Kimbrough from Dillard encouraged students on HBCU campuses to, in his words, lean in and show that they're not afraid. We can't cave to those kinds of things because if we do, they win. He and other leaders say they don't think the threats will affect recruitment moving forward. For the Gulf States Newsroom, I'm Bobby Jean Mizick. The Gulf States Newsroom is a partnership among public media stations in Alabama, Louisiana, and Mississippi. The annual Mississippi Governor's Arts Awards are tomorrow. The awards aim to recognize individuals and organizations who have made major contributions to artistic excellence in the state. This year's Governor's Choice Award honoree is event planner and fundraiser Holly Lang, who currently serves as the executive director of the Mississippi Book Festival. She tells us she's moved by this recognition. I'm very excited to receive this award. My very first job when I moved to Mississippi um, after college in Jackson was to work on the Governor's Arts Award. So this is a nice full circle to actually, it never occurred to me, it never dawned on me that I would actually be a recipient one day. And I worked for the Governor's Arts Awards for three or four years and admired so many of the recipients uh, and their work. So I'm, I'm very appreciative and humble. Well, that's wonderful. You are the should I say, creator of the annual Mississippi Book Festival? I am. Tell us a little bit about that, why you started it, and what it means. 
I grew up going to the Texas Book Festival in my early young adult life. And when I moved here and I took classes at Millsaps College, I actually took Eudora Welty's last, the last class she taught at Millsaps. Um, I got to meet her and learn from her. And in everything I do in the past 20 years, I just kept thinking, there, there's so much talent here. Why on earth does Mississippi not have a book festival to recognize all of these amazing um, writers that have come before us, our current uh, crop of really amazing authors, and a future generation of authors? That, you know, a festival sort of generates all of those creative processes and encourages writers as well as readers uh, to get really involved into books. So it, it took me a little while to sort of find the time and the, to make the commitment to create a book festival. The right people had sort of gathered to start talking about having a book festival. Kind of it all came together in one fell swoop, and we were able to start it um, slowly, and we did it you know, sort of small the first year intentionally so people could learn about the Mississippi Book Festival and learn what a book festival was about. It is not your junior high book fair. It really is. We bring authors in from across the United States, and we promote our own authors, and we want people to come to the state capitol where we consider that to be neutral territory and meet authors and continue their love for reading and buy a bunch of books from our independent bookstores across the state and really um, celebrate the arts and humanities. We And we tied it in so we have an official artist, so it's not just about authors. We have an official artist. Um, we always have some entertainment, and we have different panels that focus on a variety of arts, whether that's cooking, um, music, actual art, visual art, and certainly the art of book writing and bookmaking. It's become very successful. What year did you start it? 2015 was the first year. Are you surprised that in six or seven years it's become so big? We worked really hard and slowly and methodically to build it up, but there was so much support from participants, from authors who wanted to come and participate, as well as attendees. The first year, we had lines wrapped around columns inside the Capitol uh, for people who couldn't get in because every, there were not enough seats, and we had we had people packed into the state capitol. So it was we we did roll the dice the first year, and we were pleasantly surprised at the amount of support um, for the festival and the people who were willing to attend. And those numbers have increased every year. So I think our first year we had just under four thousand people there, and our last year in person we had just over ten thousand. And we are anxious to be back in person again this year. And we don't know if COVID will allow those kind of numbers um, again at the state capitol and at, at the at the capitol complex, but we are optimistic that we will all be together in person. Is there anything that you'd like to point out that I didn't ask? Our podcast with MPB has been wildly successful. We have when during the festival we capture several um, authors to come in, and we have a recording booth at the festival. So from an archival standpoint, from a history standpoint, we really have captured some of the absolute best Mississippi writers and national and international writers in the last five years. And that's all archived on our website. So people can go back and look at the video of the panels that they were interested in, or there's a podcast on the MPP website, and they can listen to some of their favorite authors. And that personalizes authors for people. Um, and it makes them feel like they have a personal – it makes readers feel like they have a personal relationship with their author, their favorite author. Holly Lang, thank you so much for your time and speaking with us. Again, congratulations on the Governor's Arts Award. That okay, is magnificent so and obviously truly deserved. That's a lot of work. We have we have pushed a rock uphill for quite some time, and we are, are, are really excited with the success of the book festival. The Governor's Arts Awards will be broadcast live tomorrow at 6 p.m. on MPB TV and Think Radio. This has been Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Stick around for a full morning of Mississippi Radio. Coming up at 9, it's Fix It 101. Then at 10, it's Everyday Tech. And at 11, don't miss Southern Remedy. Find past installments of this and other Think Radio shows online at mpbonline.org. I'm Desiree Frazier. See you tomorrow morning at 8.30 for the next Mississippi edition, only on MPB Think Radio. Have a good day.